Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This week is the first Sunday of Advent, and we are beginning a new year um, for November 27th, 2022. Our first reading is from Isaiah, the second chapter, verses 1 through 5. The psalm is 122. The second reading is Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. And our Matthew reading is from 24th chapter, verses 36 through 44. Welcome to year A, 2022-23. Yeah, and happy Advent to both of you. Happy Advent. Matt's favorite Advent to all of our listeners. Matt's favorite season. He loves Advent. It's the best. <laughs> A season of expectation and joy. I like it too. Yes. Yeah. Well, a couple of a couple of things we do this every year, uh, but it's I think they're important uh, steps as the preacher moves into a new year, new lectionary year, and of course a new season. And the first is uh, to have a sense of Matthew, right? So you want to be sure that you spend a little time thinking about. Uh, Matthew and and some of the themes of Matthew, so they're not just like diving in and like because you're in a whole new universe now from uh, from Luke. <laughs> and uh, I actually I thought the commentary, uh, you know, I'm reading ahead and looking at all of Advent, and uh, so in preparation for today, just looking you know looking at all all four of our advent texts and i was reading the commentary by stanley saunders on matthew 1 18 through 25 and the paragraph that begins matthew will portray jesus the son of david as an atypical monarch that paragraph i found particularly helpful to kind of reorient my matthew perspective and maybe i would i would suggest that to preachers is to read ahead uh, and and as a way to get yourself again oriented to matthew's matthew's theological landscape and matthew's commitments uh so that otherwise you drop down in matthew 24 and you're like what <laughs> uh, where, where am i so that would be one and just some really helpful perspectives uh, with regard to what is Matthew's portrayal of, of Jesus, what is at stake for him theologically. And so that would be one suggestion I have to get people going into year eight. That's all great because it's it's a lot of reorientation, not just starting over at Advent, but also in a new gospel and everybody's got their favorites and their least favorite gospel. Mm -hmm. um, but Matthew, I think, has a lot to say to our current situation. There's a lot in Matthew about God working uh, in undercover ways, in surprising ways. Maybe this text doesn't do too much about that, but this is a text about surprise and about readiness and about the idea of there being some kind of, of distinction being made, which, again, that's language that can be hopeful and helpful to some and a little off-putting to others. But I think for preachers working with this text, you really have to start thinking about the context of it because it is it is the end of a much longer discourse. It's, it's part of a speech or a segment in Matthew where Jesus is preparing his followers for life without him. Mm -hmm. Now we're used to like the Gospel of John talking about that with John 13 through 17 and in the synoptics, it's a little more broken up in terms of these final words, but that's what's partly going on here. And, and he imagines for them a world full of risk uh, and a world full of danger, not just because the world is messed up, but also I think because the confession of following this different sort of King that we talked about is going to uh, put a bit of a target on their backs in some ways, but also puts a, a certain level of responsibility and accountability on them to be particular kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And before people get too worried about that and think that that's all legalism or that that's all hard work, part of what that is is hopefulness. Yeah. 
part of watchfulness is hopefulness. I think those are those are akin. Yeah, I think. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Yeah, I appreciate uh, both of that. I I think uh, this is an opportunity. Uh, it, it would seem odd for the way that we would enter Advent because we so often uh, think of Advent as the season of Christmas and the preparation for the Christmas holiday. And uh, so by the liturgical calendar, uh, the Christian year, this is a reminder of remembering uh, in one way that the God who uh, lived among us promises to return. And we are living in the meantime. And you've heard me say before, the meantime are mean times. And so, uh, as Matt has said, this uh, entry into this first Sunday of Advent where we're recognizing the words of Jesus at the end of his life before we are going to shift to the incarnation is um, uh, that theological ground that Caroline was mentioning for us to set. It's, it's recognizing that what we are anticipating is reading the story the second time around. So it is difficult to preach this season because People show up for the Christmas holidays, but that's also how these stories were originally heard, uh, were originally read. And that is that they were the stories that confirmed what folks knew had already happened. So starting at the end of Jesus' life and what Jesus is describing um, to anticipate until his return is the appropriate way to enter into the season of Advent so that we don't get distracted by the Christmas season of the consumerist uh, secular season, but we actually know in the midst of all that's going on in the world. I mean, the tumult and the trauma and the trials that we are currently experiencing are being experienced globally if we would attend to it. And our answer is not in government. It's not in the usual kind of king. It is the claim of the covenant-keeping God. And Matthew is setting up that kind of understanding of the world in light of the incarnation. Um, and I, I, I agree to look ahead at where you are going in this season so that when you start on, on um, the first Sunday of Advent, you know where you are taking your listeners. Yeah. I think we're naming something too that I want to bring to the surface. And that is when we move into Advent, of course, there are typical themes that uh, that we talk about for this this liturgical season watchfulness waiting those kinds of those kinds of themes pop up every single year but we are also i think naming certain kinds of advent themes but through the lens of matthew right. and so i think that that's another thing that i would want to raise up for preachers is to say how is it that Matthew can inspire particular themes for this Advent in 2022. And then especially as those themes intersect with what you were saying, Joy. So this theme, these themes of, of watchfulness, but also hopefulness, uh, these themes of, um, and we're, we'll get this as we move through uh, the next few Sundays, uh, this theme of discernment. Right. And and judgment, but not judgment that that you're you know going to, you know, where or something, but it, it judgment in terms of discernment and decision making exactly. and and determining uh, the presence of God, as you said, Matt, in in surprising ways or in undercover ways. And so I think all of those themes could be really powerful for this particular advent and for the preacher to have those. And then and and then see how those are affirmed in each of these texts going forward, I think would be a really helpful homiletical strategy. And to really accept the challenge of focusing on Matthew. Mm -hmm. um, if you want a homiletical hook for that, um, you can just say, you know, for the next few weeks, we're going to tune into this particular network. And we know the other networks have a different opinion. Uh, they're going to have a different slant. But for the next uh, season, we will be taking Matthew's slant. And 
being curious about what that will raise for us in understanding the expectation of the promise, Mm -hmm. promise keeping God's fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that analogy of a network of changing a network and how, how disruptive that can be (laughs) in certain households. Um, to, to maybe settle our feet down a bit on what that might look like. I mean, I think for me, for Matthew, well, let me back up a bit. The last couple of weeks, we've talked somewhat about apocalypticism with the, the end of, of year C. And at the heart of so much apocalyptic ways of thinking in the New Testament is this deep dissatisfaction with how things are and this belief that there is something deeply flawed or broken or dangerous about the current age in which we live, which is getting in the way, so to speak, of the fullness of all of God's promises. And I think Matthew's way of inhabiting that, the the gospel's way of inhabiting that, is not to explain it, but to acknowledge that longing, but also where Jesus keeps showing up in these fragile, vulnerable places. And so the best example of that has got to be the Beatitudes. Mm-hmm. And it gets renewed in places like Matthew 25 and the sheep and the goats. It gets renewed in Matthew 20 with the workers in the vineyard and other places. Uh, chapter 13 with the weeds and the wheat. I mean, there's a, a number of spots. But what that means for for today and for this text, I think, is this idea of well, what Stan Saunders said, right? We're not able to, we don't know what's going to happen. This text doesn't tell us what happens next. Mm-hmm. It sure doesn't tell us when that happens next, but it tells us to be ready. And Mm -hmm. I think that orients our vision in some ways to seeing God showing up in strange and exciting and sometimes scandalous places and among strange, exciting and scandalous people Mm -hmm. from time to time. And so the the readiness, watchfulness here is less, make sure your bags are packed and more, don't miss Jesus when he shows up in obscure people, obscure places, you know what I mean by obscure there. And because for Matthew, faith is this, it's this fragile, breakable thing uh, in other places too. And so it's not, the book's not looking for perfect understanding or perfect belief. It's asking you to hang on and to find him in the, in, 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 in spots you weren't expecting. And I think that's reflected in some ways in this passage if I'm right, that that's what Matthew puts before us on that network. And the challenge is so many of what we've heard about this text uh, in a lot of corners has been trying to um, um, decipher some uh, coded uh, clarity. And I think you're right, Matt. Uh, It's really setting us up to saying, we don't know. Uh, Jesus is saying, you know, he doesn't know. know. (laughs) He's not holding back. Only the father knows and be ready. And that becomes the focus. And and that's where this particular reading is broken in the lectionary. And I think that's a good one for it. Uh, Verse 44, therefore you also, also in the sense of all those different regular, everyday, ordinary possibilities of practicing life must be ready for in an unexpected hour. That is when the Son of Man will return. And it's, we, we, need, we need some clarity right now. Everything seems to be up for grabs. There, there's nothing stable. And yet it's in that instability that we are called to maintain hope, maintain faith, and to watch because God is still the reigning king and is still going to return at an hour we can't predict. So rather than get lost in predictions, let's find ways to be ready because this isn't the first time that this has happened. It happened in the days of Noah. And and as with everything that we read, we're always reading in hindsight. So let's pay attention to the hindsight and not get lost in what we cannot know about this text or the return of Christ. And and that readiness is communal. And I I think it will help people 
it, it help a preacher to help people distinguish what does it mean for an individual to stay wakeful, watchful, ready? What does it mean for a community and how is that part of a vocation to to assist a community in this kind of what I would call an active hope? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think too, the a couple of lines from the commentary and then we should uh, probably move on mm -hmm. is that, mm -hmm. uh, that Sten Saunders says the point uh, for those who know this much is to live in light of this transformed reality. And that's kind of also what I hear us talking about is a kind of uh, tension maybe between that uh, between that reality that we know is to come, but the reality that is here now, but we're not, we're not being removed from that. And that's not the point. It's, it's that readiness. And then he uses the term uh, that watchfulness or wakefulness is here, not a defensive or preventative posture, but a heightened attentiveness. And I really like that, that uh, Advent is attentiveness. Um, and, uh, and that has a nice little alliterate, well, assonance mm -hmm. to it uh, for some rhetorical flair. Uh, so that, that, that attentiveness and how can you invite people into that attentiveness and share that attentiveness uh, in their own lives, I think would be, I think would connect with a lot of people, a lot of hearers. Yeah. And if we turn that to Isaiah, uh, I'm thinking of um, what is the promise and the hope? Where are the places in the midst of all of the, um, what is the word I want to say? In the midst of all of the, um, uh, okay, I'm trying to say something that has to do with the fact that we're fighting one another all the time. Um, all of the division, there's the word I was looking for. Uh, I was on. So, in the custody. <laughs> I, I couldn't come up with anything. I guess I don't want to. I don't want to keep admitting it. But in the midst of all the division that's going on, the Isaiah text reminds us that their swords will be uh, uh, beat into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So here we have that very familiar text um, that is the very promise that in the midst of the trials and the trauma, the there will be a time of truth and that the testing will be over and we will experience the tender peace of God. I tried to find an alliteration for you, Caroline, in that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but th that text allows us to pay attention to why would Isaiah say that they were going to be moving from war to peace unless the moment that they were currently living in was a time when peace seemed unexpectable. It seemed so far out in um, the imagination. And yet this is the promise that Isaiah is offering. And that's where we are today, to offer for the community that kind of reality, even though individually and collectively we're living in time in seasons of division. Yeah. I I well, we've talked so much about Matthew and and I would focus on Matthew primarily, I guess, through Advent. So I'll just put my cards on the table there. But but the way in which you're talking, Joy, is how, you know, how how some of these themes that we've already mentioned uh get reaffirmed or you get different kinds of vocabulary or images to describe then what we're what we're after. And uh with the Isaiah text. I would use verse five, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord mm -hmm. as a kind of refrain in my sermon, uh, that, that that's what we're being called to do is walk in the light. And as you said, Joy, when, you know, when, when darkness seems to ab uh, abound. And um, so it's sort of a, a um, Advent is a, is this, um, deliberate walk <laughs> of, uh, and a deliberate way of being kind of resistance, mm -hmm. a resistance walk uh, that insists on looking for the light uh, in the midst of darkness. So mm -hmm. that's what I would do. I would take that, I would take that phrase and have it be a refrain throughout my whole sermon. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful text. And we've got four great Isaiah texts this Advent. Mm -hmm. Which I know makes Joy happy because she loves Isaiah. Mm -hmm. 
this one, you know, the poetry speaks for itself. You don't, you, you might wreck it if you go too deep into taking it apart and some of the yeah. imagery here, yeah. but it's that setting it into context, like Joy was saying, like, what does this sound like in the midst of war and crisis? And so how do you locate this, this Zion theology in the midst of circumstances where it looks so far-fetched? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I know they did this to Jeremiah, but if I were living at this point in time, I'd want to throw Isaiah into a pit because I'd be like, you know, this is not helpful, right? Your pie in the sky stuff, your, your beautiful future vision uh, isn't helpful. We've got a war we're ready to fight, you know, or, or, or we're getting ready to run and get out of here. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, these words stuck for some reason. And somehow, even though they are so dissonant with what people were experiencing at the moment, I, you have to imagine. And if, if you follow just the way Isaiah is written, this is chapter two. In chapter one, Isaiah is basically reading out the worst. Yeah. So there's a context for this promise where um, Isaiah knows exactly what's going on. Um, so if you want to be a bit um, edgy, which um, I, I sometimes think Advent isn't the season to be too edgy simply because a lot of folks come back for that season. And it might be nice to let them know that God is loving on them, despite the fact they've been absent for a while. But notwithstanding, if you want to be edgy, another refrain uh, from Isaiah would be uh, in the midst of uh, uh, the divisions we're in right now is to remind our communities that uh, it is God who will be the one who judges between the nations. And it is God is the, God is the one who will arbitrate among the people. And so um, it, it reminds us to use Caroline's words, to walk in the light of God as opposed to trying to figure out again, what do we need to do to fix things? Well, if Isaiah 1 is right, we've pretty much fixed, broken everything. And Isaiah 2 is, and it is God who is the one that is faithful to fix it. Which if I use that as a segue would see, would be a wonderful way to understand why Psalm is powerful because it's going into the house of the Lord, not into the house of my particular um, affinity group. Mm -hmm. I found the, the commentary by Jason Biassi on the website really helpful in terms of thinking about how I'm supposed to relate to this vision of Jerusalem mm -hmm. as somebody who lives half a world away and as somebody who's not Jewish. And so just walking through this kind of this fourfold interpretation of the of the Middle Ages and, and mm -hmm. helping people imagine what this looks like and then to help people imagine the 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 expectation of being on a journey to like the best place ever <laughs> mm -hmm. right or to a place where that, that actually is meant to promote human flourishing whatever that, that place looks like mm -hmm. for a community mm -hmm. yeah so what time is it Romans time. You, you caught me very well. So we've got uh, three out of four of our Advent texts are from Romans. The third Sunday of Advent is a, a lection from James. Uh, but here we have this, uh, this text that I think resonates with quite a few of our themes that we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that same kind of urgency that we see Jesus preaching mm -hmm. in in the Gospels is also a hallmark of the church, as far as we can tell from Paul's writing. So Paul has that same that same urgency, uh, or the church remembers Jesus as an urgent preacher, as a kind, as an apocalyptic prophet, which is a reminder again. Advent is a recognition of that same clash between the discrepancy or the discont this discontinuity between what we live in and what's promised. And so this is why I love Advent is because it's also a season of complaint and of grumbling and of dissatisfaction and of demanding God to, to show up or, and, and, and of course, in doing that, we recognize our own need to, to live out an active hope. And you, you have here an, another metaphor, another image, if you will, of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, so walking in the light. But, uh, but 
I like that metaphor for Advent because there's a visibility or an observe observability in the way you choose to be and the way, so living in the light uh, uh, and walking in the light of Jesus is going to be observable to others uh, and observable in your community. And so that, that again, that intention of, of living in living with this kind of hopefulness and this kind of uh, certainty about about God's presence in the world deeply shapes how you are in the world, mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm, I'm not sure how I'm not sure we say that as often as we should as preachers mm-hmm. that this is not I was with some preacher my beginning preachers yesterday and. Sometimes these beginning preachers get super, super nervous about talking about how to live and call to action. And especially sometimes in a Lutheran context, they get all freaked out about works righteousness. And, uh, and, uh, but, but it, but how to, how to invite people into this, uh, this kind of embodying the gospel, um, and embodying what you believe and uh, and what that looks like and what that can be. It's not always something that you have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think is a I think is an important homiletical theme. I love your metaphor idea. I had uh, the the light idea reminds me uh, I had a bishop who um, whenever you were in a meeting with him, and particularly if um, the content of that meeting was going to be uh, of, of some heaviness or some uh, difficulty, he would uh, pause and light a candle. And it was particularly to signal that in the midst of this darkness, God is present, Christ mm-hmm. is among us. And mm-hmm. um, that's that's what's happening here in Romans. It's what is happening in Matthew. It's what is happening in Isaiah. It's what is happening according to the psalmist. And it's what is happening in our world. And the specificity of us being the light, the glimpse of God's presence in the midst of whatever powers are around us is the very hope of the season of Advent.